welcome to the channel if you're new here. And if you enjoy horror stories, please hit subscribe and join us. Also, leave a like on today's video to show your support. Thank you. Let's begin. It was a big house for four family members in the middle of nowhere. These types of holidays were always my dad's idea. He was the kind of guy who preferred being outside. I think he hated being indoors. Every holiday I'd been on since I was about three years old had something to do with nature, or the great outdoors, as he would call it. This particular holiday had taken a turn for the worst. My grandma, who was supposed to come with us, fell ill with an infection. This meant my mom had to stay home and take care of her. So it was just me, my two younger brothers, and my dad on this trip. We didn't really enjoy dad's holidays. And mom often acted as a buffer between us and dad's tension. We used to argue a lot. And I was 14 years old at the time of this story. As you can imagine, being an adolescent and going through all the hormone changes, sometimes I actually thought I could beat my dad in a fight. I was pretty delusional. When we first arrived at this rundown barn shack, my dad's eyes lit up with excitement. He pulled the car out front, leaped out of the driver's seat, and ran around to the trunk to grab all our stuff. I couldn't help but wonder why he couldn't be this enthusiastic about being at home. Why couldn't he clean our rooms, do all the dishes, and be happy like this instead of getting all worked up over some cheap Airbnb that probably cost him a cent a night? To say the place needed renovation would be a massive understatement. Rust, mold, overgrown plants, and even some old rusty vehicles scattered about the land. It was quite a sight. Could you call this place a holiday home? I had no idea. Little did my brothers and I realize that it was about to get a whole lot worse. So much worse that I wouldn't even know what a world of pain would feel like until those very moments. The first morning we woke up, it wasn't to the smooth sound of an alarm. Instead, it was to the sound of dad opening our door and clapping his hands, dancing around. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to see your father happy, but this guy was just loony. He was off his head and acting more like a drug addict than someone enjoying a holiday. The only benefit to this place was that we weren't near our annoying neighbors, Denise and Daniel. Those guys in their 70s were complete nuisances. They used to go around having a go at us for everything. You're on a push bike? Oh, that's illegal. You're on your scooter on the sidewalk? Oh, that's illegal. You're playing music slightly too loud with your window open? That's illegal. You're having a barbecue and the smoke is drifting into their yard? That's illegal. I guess you guys understand. And you probably also have terrible neighbors yourselves. So, being surrounded by nothing but nature and open fields on the first morning, even if it was abrupt and somewhat scary, being woken by clapping was relaxing. I knew I could look out the window open it and play music without Denise coming around and banging on the wall, or worse, actually calling the cops, which, believe it or not, she's done three times. Once we got breakfast sorted, Dad did all the washing up and even planned out the day meticulously. To spare you all the nonsense of the actual day, we'll skip ahead to the evening when we returned to the Airbnb. We'd had lunch out, so dad planned on cooking dinner in the Airbnb. Don't ask me how, as the stove looked like it had mold, dirt, and even feces growing on top of it. I wish I had taken photos to attach to this, but unfortunately, I didn't. My dad started firing up the stove, three of which didn't even work, so only one hob was left to actually light up. This meant that cooking dinner took around two hours 
instead of the original 40 minutes, as intended according to his recipe book by Gordon Ramsay. Dad liked getting into cooking, but I'll be honest, I didn't like it. I don't think he was that good, and his food was quite tasteless. I was thankful, though. We were hungry, and we spent the whole day out and about burning calories. Dinner ended up being some type of steak. It came with mashed potatoes and some vegetables that seemed to be sauteed or marinated in this weird barbecue sauce. Overall, I'd rate it a 7 out of 10. It's probably up there as one of Dad's best meals. Maybe it would have been a higher rating without the thought of knowing it was cooked in microbes and rust. After dinner, my brothers and I went back to our bedroom, and Dad just messed about in the kitchen for a while. I don't know what he was doing, but this place didn't have a TV, so we couldn't watch anything. We went back to our room, and by that time, the sun was setting, and it was pretty late. I think we ate dinner at around 10 p.m. Afterward, Dad just went quiet. At around midnight, my brother and I stayed up on our phones until they drained of battery. Then, we had nothing left to do since there was no electricity in this area. Everything was run off of oil and gas lamps. The stove was run off oil burners, and there were also massive gas canisters around the back of the property. For plumbing, they had a septic tank, which was actually overflowing. Whenever you'd walk around the back of the property, it stank so bad that it made you want to vomit. It was 1 a.m., and it was getting late, so I guessed I needed to get to sleep, as we had another one of Dad's special days planned for tomorrow. I laid there in my bed, my brother James. My other two brothers fell asleep instantly, so they must have been pretty tired. While I was lying there, I was just reminiscing about the day that had passed, memories shooting through my mind. All of a sudden, I heard a cough coming from outside the cabin. The walls in this Airbnb were probably around three inches thick, just wood, and there were even some gaps where the light came through. That's how poorly maintained this place was. Hearing someone cough outside wasn't something that would typically shock me, but then I realized that Dad wasn't outside, and he had no reason to be. I got up and opened the bedroom door quietly, not wanting to wake James or my other brother. I went through to Dad's room and opened his door. He was snoring like crazy, too. Who the heck just coughed? I went back to my room and decided to look out the window. It was at that very moment when I saw a figure standing there, maybe a quarter of a mile off in the distance. At first, I was terrified, but then something struck me. I had only spent around five or ten seconds checking if Dad was still asleep. The cough sounded right by the window. Yet in ten seconds, this figure managed to run a quarter of a mile away from the cabin. There's no way I could have heard a cough from that far. The figure was a long way away. It was a full moon, or nearly a full moon, so most of the surrounding fields were lit up. I kept staring at this figure, absolutely petrified. Hey, hey, wake up, I said to my other brothers. They must have taken a whole 20 seconds just to respond to me. As I was staring at this figure, he wasn't moving and he wasn't looking in my direction. He seemed to be looking off to the left of the property. He wasn't moving an inch, and I started to think I was seeing things. Maybe 30 seconds later, James gets his tired and sorry legs out of the bed. He comes over to the window and goes silent. I had never really seen James shocked in my whole life, but in that moment, I knew he was. What the heck, he mutters into my ear. We need to get Dad now. I turned to him and nodded, directing him to go and get Dad while I kept an eye on this guy. Still, something didn't explain how the cough sounded so near to the window, yet the man was so far away. 
As James went to get Dad, I... I could hear him knocking on the door, with Dad talking through the other side of the wall. As I turned back towards the wall where Dad and my brother James were talking, I turned my head back to the figure. No, he wasn't disappearing. No, he wasn't fading. He was still there. But in those split few seconds that I was staring at this figure, after just turning away, I saw something pass by the window, inches away. It was another figure of a person. They passed by so quickly that I couldn't even make out any features or what clothes they were wearing. I took a deep breath and almost fell backward in shock. I landed on my bed and just sat there, frozen in place, as if I couldn't move. As I listened carefully, I could hear the footsteps of someone walking around the cabin. A few minutes later, James comes in with Dad. Dad goes into the kitchen, grabs a knife, and goes straight out onto the porch, yelling. He goes full-blown into survival mode. At this point, once Dad started yelling, my two brothers and I were in the bedroom, looking out the window at the figure in the distance, a quarter of a mile away. He turned and started running. But then something even creepier happened. There was a guy standing right on the other side of our window. He too, started running straight in the direction of the other guy further up. My dad's yells revealed another man inches away from the wall where we were standing, watching. He was bald, had a jacket on, and was wearing some type of white boots. It was a bit of a bizarre attire, but we didn't know who these guys were or where they'd come from. We weren't trusting anything now. On the third night, I was scared to sleep. Dad didn't report anything to the police. He said, I did the work, boys. I scared them off. No need to worry. Just simple thieves out in these farmlands. Thieves are everywhere. It's easy pickings. No cameras, CCTV, or anything like that. They never get caught. And it's easy for them to make a living. My dad was even certain that this believe this was just thieves looking to steal stuff. What happened on the third night completely disproved this theory. On the third night, everything went completely and horribly wrong. We were trying to sleep, but I started hearing knocks coming from the front door. Terrified, I immediately woke my two brothers up again, who were somehow sound asleep, snoring. We went into Dad's room, woke him up, and the four of us walked towards the door. As my dad opened the door, there was no one there. There was simply this weird bit of honey, a massive comb of it shaped in this strange pattern formation. The only way I could describe it is like a pine cone, but a massive 30 inch one covered in honey. All of a sudden, I noticed a hand reach out and spray something all over this honeycomb thing. That's when the spraying started, and then almost simultaneously, an insane sound of buzzing bees started going crazy. Out of this honeycomb thing came bee upon bee upon bee, thousands and thousands of them, flooding right toward me and my two brothers' faces. Dad started leaping around everywhere. I caught sight of the person who sprayed the honeycomb. They ran off throwing the canister on the porch, but my attention was short-lived. I noticed a guy who looked similar to the one from the night before running off, but that attention was short-lived as I got three stings on my forehead, then another two, one on my eyelid. We were being swarmed by bees, and they were now all inside the Airbnb. Dad went over to grab water from the kitchen. He was screaming in pain and agony. None of us knew what to do, and my brother James was on the floor, rolling around like crazy. The bees had been attacking us for a couple of minutes. My dad's face was completely swollen, and I made my way into my bedroom, grabbing the covers and trying to cover myself up to stop them from stinging. There were dead bees everywhere. Myself, 
my brothers, and my dad had over 50 bee stings. We were taken to the accident and emergency department. The ambulance came and drove us there. We were given medications to cope with the reactions and inflammation. They then proceeded to pull out those little things that they put in your skin each time they sting. Whoever this was didn't forget. My dad swore that he'd find these people and kill them, but he never did. He even spent five grand on private investigators who were useless and came to absolutely no leads. Now I'm in my late twenties, and I'm yet to experience any pain near that. I can't begin to explain to you how bad it felt, and how much I was begging God to unally me that night. This is probably one of the most bizarre stories you'll ever hear about Airbnb. It doesn't involve killing, stalking, or imaginary ghosts, or stupid paranormal tales. Instead, it's somewhat comedic, hilarious, yet tinged with a bit of fear. In 2020, it was time for us to go on holiday. We didn't think much of it at the time because my family doesn't really go on holiday often. That's mainly because we don't really enjoy it. We've never been the type of family to go on holiday frequently. Our holiday was at an Airbnb in Illinois. It wasn't our idea of a great holiday, but since it wasn't our choice, and we weren't the ones picking the location, there wasn't much we could do. During our stay at the Airbnb, it's kind of hard to explain, but you need to picture two houses next to each other, joined together by their walls. They weren't separate houses in the sense that they had a wall blocking them. Instead, there was a door right in between the two walls. If this door was opened, it would lead through to the other house. So now, I'm guessing you're getting this in your imagination. This was the layout of the Airbnb. The original owners lived in the house next door, and the people who rented it for the holiday lived in the house next to them, which they also owned. The only thing separating us from them was a door in between the wall, and they had the key for that, not us. However, they did say if we needed anything, we should just knock on the door. There were a couple of times when we heard them arguing. We had only arrived for one night, and already things were kicking off. I thought they were going to be a pretty abusive family, or they were going to be obnoxious, noisy, and just interrupt our entire holiday. I was planning on leaving sooner rather than later, but my mom and dad thought otherwise, seemingly saying this is a part of normal family life. I don't know what they meant by that because growing up, we never argued or fought like this family were. At times, it was kind of scary and I could have sworn that I heard things being thrown around. When I finally got to sleep on the second night, something happened to me that I'll never forget sleepwalking before, so I was still a bit on edge. I was lying in bed, trying to relax and get some sleep, but adjusting to new surroundings is always tough for me. I don't sleep well in unfamiliar beds, to be honest. I'm an awful sleeper in random houses. As I was trying to rest and calm my anxiety, I noticed some sounds coming from the other side of my bedroom door. At first, I thought maybe dad had gotten up to grab a cup of water or use the bathroom, but the noises kept going. It sounded like someone's footsteps, their bare feet against the wooden floor. The floorboards in this Airbnb were so creaky. They sounded old, like they hadn't been replaced in a decade or two. I know that sounds short, but when you think about it, some of these houses have floors made of cheap materials, the type that breaks, rots, and erodes within only five to 10 years. The creaking continued, and I started to think that I needed to get out of bed and see what was going on. There's no way mom or dad would just walk up and down my bedroom door, so I decided to open it. 
when I opened it, I nearly pissed myself, not with laughter, but with absolute fear. As I opened the door, I was met with the sight of a lady. She had her eyes shut and was just standing right there on the spot. I screamed, probably the loudest I'd ever screamed in my entire life above the age of nine. The lady then woke up and started screaming too. It turns out she had been sleepwalking. She took the key, opened the door between the two houses and the wall, and came through, just walking up and down the hallway in our Airbnb. Mom and Dad woke up, and this little Asian lady, who was the homeowner of both houses, was kind of apologetic and really embarrassed. On top of this, I saw her in her nightclothes, which was kind of funny. She started crying, went to her head, and started apologizing and bowing at us, as if it was her traditional way of saying sorry. She then went back into her house and shut her door. After that, we didn't hear from her that night. Just to be sure, Dad put all of our luggage and all our suitcases back right up against the door. So if she tried to come in, it would make a hell of a noise, alerting us in the night. We went back to bed that night, and although I don't think I got any sleep, I think Mom and Dad did. I was kind of giggling a bit to myself because, although this was scary, it kind of put my mind at rest, knowing it was just the lady next door. She didn't really say if she suffered from sleepwalking before, so I was still a bit on edge. Me? It wasn't like the last time. Instead, she went one step further. She opened the door between the walls, walked into our property or our Airbnb, and then made her way over to my parents' bedroom. She then proceeded to open their door and walk right up to their bed, all while completely unconscious, sleepwalking. She had no idea where she was and that she was once again, inside the Airbnb that she had already rented out. On that third night, it was around 1 a.m. in the morning. We'd all been asleep for around an hour, and I remember hearing a scream coming from the bedroom next door. It was my mom. I could tell instantly. Shocked, I jumped out of bed and ran straight into their room. Something in my mind knew that it would just be this. I could almost predict what was happening in my head. When I got in there though, things were a lot worse, like way worse. I opened their door slightly as it was still slightly ajar. Then upon closer inspection, when my eyes adapted to the darkness, I could see my dad on top of the lady, my mom screaming, curled up in the corner. The lady had a bleeding nose and it was clear as day that dad had basically hit her out of fear. My mom screamed, resulting in my dad waking up. My dad's reflexes hit the lady, who was standing over him, staring at him. The lady woke up while in a lot of pain with a bleeding nose. Dad, still unaware that it's the Airbnb host, jumps on top of her, thinking it's an intruder. Then he realizes it's her again, all of this could have been avoided if we just remembered to put the damn suitcases behind the door. That way, the lady would have had to push really hard to get through to our house. When people sleepwalk, they lose most of their strength. They can only do little tasks. And although there are some records of pretty crazy things like people making sandwiches or even food, most sleepwalkers are pretty. How do we put this? soft. Once the lady woke up, she started screaming and crying yet again. I felt bad for her the first time, but this time, just felt pissed off with her. She had done the same thing again. Surely there are ways to stop her from doing this, but it didn't end there. She took that as an opportunity to call 911. When the cops arrived, they were really aggressive towards dad and put him in handcuffs. Even though 
Myself and my mom tried to explain the situation to them. They didn't pay much attention at first. The lady actually lied, saying that my dad beat her up over a disputed payment. We got attorneys, and they proved that there was no disputed payment, as we had already paid the damn amount. My dad was released around half a week later. He was put in a holding cell and fed basically rat food for three or four days. The lady got the worst reviews from all three of us. And I'll be honest, I pray to God that the next people who rent there on Airbnb don't have to go through what we did. I'm not going to say what the address is. Obviously, that would be completely illegal. But in the court case, we did mention this. And the lady was going to have inspections, because it's not right. She shouldn't be allowed to just allow her condition to take over everyone's life. There should be ways to control sleepwalking, and there probably are. I just haven't looked into it, and I don't really care. My father's actions were deemed reasonable force, meaning that, in the moment, to the best of his knowledge, he truly believed that his life was in danger. Going into that court case, I didn't think Dad had a single chance. He had busted up this woman's nose really bad, and it was pouring blood. It looked like a bloody murder scene. Once the cases were all done, our family was exhausted. Our bags, luggage, and property were confiscated from the property and brought back to us at the station. That lady, I'm sorry, I had to say it. I don't know if this is some kind of stupid joke, but she needs to control herself. I get it. I feel bad for her condition and that she has to deal with that. But if she can't control it, then she shouldn't be having Airbnb clients come in and stay at the property next door. During the entirety of the court case, the lady kept acting innocent. She was acting as if she was harmed by the one that was beaten, and that somehow we were evil people. I don't know if her attorney told her to act like that, but she was a good actor, really good. With someone like me, someone with a disability, I was a burden to her son, or so she thought. And now that she was gone, I felt bad. I felt bad for Charlie, and I wanted to help. But what could I do? Charlie then started asking me weird questions, like, hey, have you ever thought about ending your own life? It was the first time I'd heard him talk like this. He was upset, but his words were really messed up. I said, no, of course. Not why would I ever think of that, Charlie? You need to talk to someone. You can't keep all this in. He looked at me and then said, Maybe, maybe it's the only way out. If I'm being honest, I didn't really know what to do. I'd never been trained to deal with someone going through this kind of pain. I knew I needed to help Charlie, but how I don't know what came over me. But I just hugged him. I just hugged him and told him that he's not alone, that he has me, and that I'll always be there for him. As he cried on my shoulder, I could feel his tears dripping down my neck. I knew I was doing the right thing. I just wish I had known that he needed professional help. It's hard to help someone when you don't even know that they're going through a lot like that. Charlie needed counseling. He needed therapy. He needed someone who could help him process his feelings and grief. But all I could offer was my support and friendship. I wish I had known better. I wish I had known how to help him. I wish I could have done more for him. I hope he's okay now. I hope he found the help he needed. I hope he's not feeling that way anymore. But I'll never forget that night when he came to me in the darkest moment of his life. And I tried to be there for him in the best way I could, even though it wasn't enough. 
even though I wasn't equipped to help it properly. It's a memory that haunts me to this day, and it reminds me that sometimes all you can do is offer your love and support to someone in need and hope that it's enough to get them through the darkness. Second client arrived, and it was a single man in his late forties. He had a strange vibe to him, and it made both Charlie and me uncomfortable. We decided to keep an eye on him from my driveway to ensure nothing unusual was happening. As the man entered the house, we watched closely. He seemed to be inspecting every corner, almost obsessively. It was clear that he was not just a regular Airbnb guest. Charlie's dad had mentioned that they had been having issues with the previous client, but he didn't provide many details. As we observed the man from a distance, we noticed him going through the house's rooms, opening drawers, and even checking under the beds. It was as if he was searching for something specific, and it gave us an eerie feeling. After a while, the man left the house and got into his car. Charlie and I decided to follow him discreetly to see where he was going. We trailed him for a while until he arrived at a remote area outside of town. He pulled over, and we watched as he met with another person, exchanging something small and mysterious. Charlie and I were both scared and confused about what we had just witnessed. We had no idea what was going on, but it was clear that something shady was happening with their Airbnb guests. We knew we had to find out more. Over the next few days, we continued to observe the Airbnb clients, trying to gather information about their activities. It became apparent that they were involved in some kind of illegal operation, possibly drug-related. We decided to gather evidence and report our findings to the authorities. It was a risky move, but we couldn't let Charlie's family be unknowingly involved in criminal activities. We documented everything we saw, including license plate numbers, suspicious interactions, and any unusual behavior. After reporting our findings to the police, they launched an investigation into the Airbnb clients. It turned out that they were indeed involved in illegal activities, including drug trafficking. They had been using the Airbnb property as a front for their operations, taking advantage of Charlie's family's desperate financial situation. The police arrested the clients, and the house was taken off Airbnb. Charlie's dad was shocked and grateful that we had uncovered the truth. Although he felt guilty for putting his son in such a situation, it was a challenging and frightening experience. But it taught us the importance of being vigilant and taking action when we suspect something is wrong. Charlie and I grew even closer through this ordeal, knowing that we had protected his family from harm window was slightly ajar, just slightly. I knew for a fact that I had closed it all the way. I never leave them open because I'm scared of bugs and other things getting into my room. I walked over to the window to check it out as I closed it. Barry's face was looking right at me. He was peering through the window. I couldn't make out his face that well. But I could see his eyes. They were wide open. And he looked more deranged and crazy than ever. He was just staring at me without blinking. I couldn't believe it. My heart was racing. I screamed as loud as I could and ran out of the room. Charlie came running out of the room to see what was going on. I told him Barry was outside the window. But when we looked back, he was gone again. I felt violated and scared out of my mind. We called the police and Charlie's dad immediately and told them everything that had happened. The police arrived shortly after and began searching the area for Barry Charlie's dad. Also came back to the house to be with us, we 
explained the whole situation to him. And he was furious that this guy had been stalking us in his own house. The police couldn't find Barry that night, but they promised to keep an eye out for him and increase patrols in the area. Charlie and I stayed up all night, too scared to sleep. We barricaded the windows and doors just to be safe. Thankfully, Barry never showed up again, and the rest of our stay was uneventful. But we were traumatized by the experience and couldn't wait to leave the Airbnb when our stay was finally over. We packed up our things and got out of there as quickly as possible. We never found out who Barry really was or why he was so fixated on us. All we knew was that it was a terrifying experience that we would never forget. And it left us both feeling vulnerable and unsafe in our own home. And to this day, we still don't know what was going through that guy's mind or why he fixated on your house. It's a bizarre and unsettling experience and it's fortunate that the situation didn't escalate further. Hopefully, you won't have to deal with such strange and unsettling encounters in the future. Airbnb experiences can range from wonderful to nightmarish, and it's always important to stay vigilant and prioritize your safety and well-being. I'd be interested to hear your theory about this, because as a whole, I guess you could say this is more of an unexplained case than a horror story. The guy's behavior was peculiar and outright freaky. If he hadn't been reported by the neighbors, would he have just kept walking up and down all night? Would he have tried to enter a house? Would he have tried to come for me and Charlie? I'll never forget that day when he turned his head and stared directly at us with his eyes. They were beaming into my soul for that split second until I dropped my body to the ground underneath the window ledge. I still talk about this encounter with Charlie almost every single day. If anything, it made us closer. Charlie moved away for university last year and this happened to us half a decade ago. I miss him, but he comes back to visit me at least once a month even if it is a six hour drive. Thank you for listening, everyone. And I don't even think Barry was his real name. Hey guys, and welcome to the channel. This is the end of today's video. So I hope you are nice and relaxed and you've enjoyed these stories. If you have, please leave a like on today's video to show your support. And also subscribe if you're new to us here on this channel. We upload every single night. They always bring brand new stories that have never been heard before on any other YouTube channels. Also, if you want to go a step further and really support the channel, try sharing the videos. This means a lot to me as I'm trying very hard to grow this channel. I've mentioned in previous videos in the outro that I'm struggling a lot. Sometimes it seems like it's impossible there are so many horror story channels on YouTube, most of which are automated or robotic. This means people use AI, which is a very cheap way, and I believe they are not the true storytellers. This affects the true storytellers and means that our videos end up getting lower views. Please help us stay alive by sharing and sharing and sharing. Thank you and I'll catch you in tomorrow's video.